is right at noon. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And I just, again, want to thank everyone for joining this week's Crisis Jam. I am your host, Laura Evans, the Director of National State Policy with Vibrant Emotional Health. And I'm very excited to host this week, although I feel like the host says that every week because it is just such great content. And so this week, I have the pleasure of being a part of the conversation around boarding in uh, EDs, emergency departments, um, which is just such a, a key conversation as we talk about coordinating the crisis continuum. So I'm just very excited about that. And we are shifting the uh, format a little bit to do our future presentation um, closer to the beginning. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. If we can move to the next slide. I uh, just wanted to let folks know about a couple of upcoming events. Uh, one uh, from Pew, which needs no introduction, uh, introduction uh, but the Pew will be hosting a uh, kind of event. Who do you call understanding how behavioral health crisis calls are handled? Uh, there's a great panel uh, put together for that, including uh, state rep uh, um, Ellison from Utah. Again, part of the team that and it started the conversation around the creation of a three-digit number. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Pinels, uh, we've got 911 and sheriffs represented. So I think that's going to be great conversations. It's October 26th at noon Eastern. Uh, and uh, I think there should be a link. There will be a link uh, for folks to register. Yeah, so once we have that, we can put that in the chat. Thank you, Jason. That's a really good suggestion. Uh, the second... Uh, event, and we can hopefully put that link in the chat as well, is uh, from the Councils of State Government Justice Center, and it's Taking the Call, a national conference exploring innovative community responder models. Uh, and I think this one is also very interesting as we talk about how we uh, kind of coordinate continuum and work across, um, you know, looking at the various states and the various models that this could take. So this event, uh, I think there's gonna be over 2000 people from all 50 states exploring how communities are working together to build more comprehensive crisis systems. Uh, again, reducing the burden on law enforcement, reducing unnecessary justice system contact uh, and ultimately better serving individuals in crisis. So this is uh, presented by the US Department of Justice, Bureau of Justice Assistance and Justice Programs. Uh, the Council of State Governments Justice Center and the University of Cincinnati. There's going to be some regular jam players, including our esteemed uh, David Co Covington. Uh, so we will put that link in the chat as well, but really good events if you were able to attend one or either. Um, I'm sure we will uh, get great feedback from them. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, and uh, again, the Crisis Jam, we have over 59 national organizations represented. Uh, all 50 states are participating, uh, including 10 Medicaid offices. Uh, and I also want to just give the call that, uh, you know, if your uh, Medicaid office is not participating, please encourage them to come to this conversation. Uh, and if there's anyone that uh, isn't participating, whether they're Medicaid or Office of Behavioral uh, health or mental health, please feel free to ensure that they have this link and that they are part of the conversations. And I think that's how we grow and how we learn uh, and keep the jam uh, nice and saucy. So next slide. Uh, this is the website. Uh, if you want to see materials, videos from the last week's uh, or previous week's crisis jams, if you want to sign up for more materials, uh, it is talk.crisisnow.com. I love the thumbnail of a young Dr. John Draper, uh, who is uh, with Vibrant Emotional Health. So, uh, you know, always good to go back and, and see what we, what the discussions have been and the progressions of the conversation. So that's all available at talk.crisisnow.com. Next slide. Okay, and so this week's quote, uh, again, uh, talking about the various components of crisis systems 
and why it's so important to avoid unnecessary law enforcement contact in <laughs> jails. Uh, you know, this is a quote from Dr. Carson on crisis receiving facilities. Uh, and his full quote is, you know, this is directed to the police, just bring them straight to us. You don't have to call or let us know. You don't need a packet. Come to us, just bring them. And I think this really highlights the importance uh, of crisis receiving facilities, and why we need to, you know, if we don't have to go through the paperwork, you know, there isn't a need to take people to jail. There is an option. Uh, and we want to make that option as easily accessible, available. Just bring them to us, I think is just, just so powerful. So uh, thank you, Dr. Carson, uh, for that. That um, quote is just really timely given the conversation for this week. Next slide. Okay, so uh, today's feature presentation again is boarding in the emergency department. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sandra Snyder. She is the immediate past president of the uh, American College of Emergency Physicians. She's the professor uh, at University of Rochester. Uh, and so I will hand it over to you. Thank you. Uh, and I first apologize. Um, of course, I used an old slide to start all this and it has my old titles on it. So I'm no longer either of those things, but uh, I am uh, the Senior Vice President for Clinical Affairs at the American College of Emergency Physicians. I am an emergency doc, uh, but my I'm no longer at the University of Rochester. That's what you get when you cut and paste a presentation with like the best slide ever and don't read it. So let's go to the next slide then. So this is what emergency departments look like. And we've all gotten very um, uh, used to seeing just very, very crowded emergency departments, but it doesn't have to be this way. And how it got this way is really um, problematic. Um, next slide. We've even had such a reputation that this was a cartoon several years ago. Uh, it, it that, you know, you know, have you been waiting long? Well, of course you have, it's an emergency department. What do you expect? Next slide. So what I wanna do today is, next slide, please. What I wanna do today is talk a little bit about the emergency department, how we got here and how we can get out and how you guys play an absolutely, totally critical role. So the emergency department is the safety net for just about everything. Uh, we catch patients uh, who don't know where to go. We catch patients when their doctors are not available. We catch patients when um, everything else is too full. I love the quote you started off with, just bring them to us. That has been our quote for years. We're just there. We're just open 24 seven. We'll take care of anything and everything. And by law, we have to. Next slide. But what you may not know about the emergency department is that approximately 50% of the inpatients of a hospital come from the emergency department, next slide, and 70% of the ICU patients come from the emergency department. So while everybody thinks about the emergency department as a place to go when you got a little tiny cut on your finger, and believe me, there's a lot of people who come that way, uh, we actually take care of some very, very sick patients. Next slide. So how do we get into this mess where we're taking care of patients in hallways, we're taking care of patients uh, in, in, in crazy places? Next slide. No one else in medicine would accept this. Well, if you look at the emergency department, there's really three ways you get in. You're either brought in by EMS, you walk in, or you come in uh, because you're transferred from another facility. And there is very little, if anything, we can do with the input into the emergency department. If you look at the egress out of the emergency department, we can transfer them to another facility. This is very frequent with a patient with a primary psychiatric uh, disorder. We can send them home. Unfortunately, we can send them to the morgue, although that's not very many, thank heavens. Uh, we can send them to an inpatient bed, and from there they can either go to a long-term care bed home or some other feature, and we can go to an ICU. Next slide. These are gonna come rapid. When uh, very, very frequently before COVID, we very, you know, we came into the problem of not having a bed, particularly at the psychiatric facility or some inpatient facility for behavioral health. 
And so we ended up holding a lot of those patients. And we had some problems uh, with long-term care. Um, and so some of the inpatient beds were not available to us. Next slide. But what has happened since COVID is that transfers out of the emergency department have become impossible, absolutely impossible. We are transferring patients across state lines routinely. We are where in the past it would be one or two calls to get a patient transferred to another facility. It's now 10 calls. Waits have gone up from a few hours to a few days to get patients out of our facility that are being transferred. And then inpatient beds, because of a severe nursing shortage, and I emphasize the word severe nursing shortage, a lot of inpatient beds have been discontinued, have been what we call browned out, uh, and long-term care beds are simply not available. Besides which, the lower level of what I would call long-term care, so we have long-term nursing home beds, but we also have group homes and boarding houses and places where we can put patients who don't have a place to go, but don't need medical care, they have completely dried up in those <clears throat> communities. And so the inpatient beds have become almost unavailable to us. And ICU beds are full either of COVID patients or of patients who've delayed care or uh, so. So we have no egress out of the emergency department for most patients. Next slide. And so what has happened is all of those patients that have previously gone to those other facilities are now boarding in the emergency department. And it, well, next slide, please. While in many cases, you would not see an operating room that has two patients in it when the operating rooms get uh, backed up, you never see two patients. You don't see four patients in a double room. You don't see two patients even in most private rooms, but in the emergency department, it's not uncommon. In fact, it's commonplace to have two or three patients in each patient room and to use hallways and to use anything that we can find to take care of patients. Next slide. And so we have this, we have a mess. Next slide. Now, if you wonder, another illustration of why this is happening is really to think of a restaurant. We've all been in this situation, right? Where we're waiting, this happens to be an Apple store, but in waiting to get in a restaurant. And we think that the restaurant is just crazy busy, right? Next slide. But actually it's, it's full of people who are having that sixth cup of coffee, who are chatting with friends, who come in and never leave. And that's what's happening in our emergency department. We're like the restaurant where no one leaves because the inpatients are sitting there, the transfers are sitting there, uh, the ICU patients are sitting there. In many places, uh, there's a nursing um, ratio. So you have to have maybe one nurse to every four patients or one nurse to every six patients. In the emergency department, there is no such ratio. And so we can take as many patients who come in and we can't stop them from coming in. And so that's one of the problems. We become the safety net for the hospital and taking care of all of these patients. Next slide. Now there's a cost to this. Uh, and that cost is that many patients don't get the care they need. I give an illustration of my aunt who had um, uh, a respiratory arrest um, in a hospital. And because there were no ICU beds, uh, they had, uh, uh, an ICU that had 10 beds, one nurse had called off, so they now had only eight beds, um, and they didn't have room for her. So they moved her from the floor to the emergency department. And when they moved her to the emergency department, uh, I called the doc, and the doc said, I'll do the best I can, but I have three ICU patients, four inpatients, and four emergency to patients, and I'll do the best I can. So this is a just, I know the, the not, things are appropriately blurred out, but this is a, a grease, uh, one of the boards that was sent to me from a hospital many years ago. And the purple is just look at the purple. These are patients who have primary psychiatric uh, diagnoses who've been there for more than 24 hours. Just click through these real quick, please. And you'll see that most of the beds, now next slide, most of the beds are being, nope, you're fine, go back. Next slide. Go, uh, most of the uh, patients there that are in those beds have been there for more than 24 hours. Now, having worked in an emergency department for 40 years, I can tell you if you put me in an emergency department for 24 hours, I'd probably not be sane. 
And if you put me there for 48 hours, I would not be sane. And I had a relative that was there for 14 days. I, and she was not sane. I don't know whether she was, had been ill to begin with. I suspect so. But. So what has happened since COVID? Well, there's an increase in patients presenting with serious psychiatric complaints. There's been a reduction of the number of options for discharging these patients. And we've had severe nursing shortages and severe shortages in every other kind of staff. Next slide. A, a couple of <coughs> bits about today. <coughs> Our, and we do a survey every several weeks. Boarding has increased and continues to increase in every emergency department across the country. We know of only one or two hospitals where they've actually gotten the patients out of the emergency department. And there doesn't seem to be an easy solution. We often have more borders, borders meaning people waiting for beds, uh, inpatient beds. We often have more borders than we actually have ED beds. And this is just very commonplace. We've had no increase, in fact, a decrease in staffing. EMS is uh, very upset because their wait times are excessive. In the Houston, uh, area, they're actually um, putting in place something to get their ambulances back in uh, service because they're very worried about this. Transfers take, as I mentioned, an average of 10 calls, often across state lines, and we have seen an increase in deaths in the emergency department because of this. We know that when you keep people in the emergency department with very limited staff taking care of them, that these patients, uh, and, you, and you prevent them from getting definitive care, that deaths occur. That, uh, yes, next slide. A couple of stories, because everyone likes stories. Upstate New York, where I'm obviously very familiar with, one hospital reported last week, 41 borders, 33 beds. Hmm. Uh, another one, a very large facility, 91 borders for a facility that has 101 beds. That facility sees approximately 150 patients a day. Um, they're gonna have 10 beds to see them through, 100, 150 patients. In Florida, the ED was so full that they moved the ED to a conference room. When that filled up with inpatients, they moved it to the cafeteria. By the way, that's a good ploy. I highly recommend you move it to the cafeteria first because everybody wants their cafeteria back. Not that many people care about their conference room. Mississippi, their ED opened up in the basement of a parking lot. At one point, the temperature was 108 in that parking lot. So they were placing ice packs on the patients and the staff were all wearing ice packs to try to keep themselves cooled. And in Texas, we have had patients transferred for ICU care to Illinois. By the way, for those of you not familiar with geography, that's a long way. And we also had one go to Connecticut. That's even a longer way. Next slide. So why am I here and what can you do and how can you help this situation? Well. We think that a big piece of this is what you guys are planning to do, and that's keep patients from coming to the emergency department. It's really, really important. The problem is, as I talk to emergency physicians across the country, they don't know about 988, and they don't know about mobile crisis units, and they don't know what you guys can do, and they don't know how to contact you. And I am sorry, I'm going to be a little bit nasty here, but mental health is a, pretty much very difficult for us to navigate. You all have different titles, you have different names, you have different locations, you've got different phone numbers, except for 988. Um, and it's hard to figure out where I'm supposed to go. And because we've never had these resources, I don't know to go look for them. As an emergency doc, I wouldn't know that there might be a mobile crisis unit called something um, in some place. So it's, I'm asking you to contact your local emergency director, emergency department director, the physician. There's one in every emergency department. I don't know their name, but if you, I, I'll help you find them if, if I can, but if you call, up the emergency department and ask for the medical director, you will get a physician. If that person's not available, ask for the nurse manager. There's one in every emergency department. They all have the same title. Tell them, if you want to say that I, I met this crazy woman, Sandy Schneider, she said to do this, let them know your resources, your capabilities, how you can help. Also, 
911 across the country does not appear to know what 988 is or has very little idea. So work with your local 911 to see about diverting calls. We've done this for the Poison Center. We can do this for mental health. Talk with the docs. When I talked with some other groups, they said, oh, we talk with the social worker every time we bring the patient in and tell them about that. So a little known fact, the social worker doesn't talk to the docs, okay? Um, and so don't talk, talk to the social worker, they're wonderful. But if they're not in contact with the ED medical director, then your voice is not getting carried. So go right to the source. And again, you can blame me, but blame ASAP. And then if you really, really, really wanna get on the good side, provide some follow-up. Just, you don't have to say, oh, they were diagnosed with this, this, and this. Just say, they're doing well. They're just doing fine. We took them and they're doing fine. We never get feedback. We have no idea. We drop our patient into a black box and we hope that that does well for them. But if we knew it did well, we'll send the next person there and the next person. So anyhow, crisis time, you know, we are in a major crisis. Most emergency departments are overflowing. We're boarding in patients. This is the right time. This is the right moment in history to make that connection. Uh, I'll pause there or stop there. Um, happy to take any questions um, and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schneider. That was a, a really great presentation and I think it was really helpful for us to, particularly the, the last of how we can close the gap. Uh, what I heard uh, from your recommendations is that there's some information silos. Uh, mental health may not necessarily know uh, about um, what's going on in the emergency department rooms. Social workers aren't speaking to doctors. So I think there's a lot, you've given us a lot to chew on and think about how we can close those gaps. One of the questions that I had, and I saw it come up in the chat as well, is when you mentioned the workforce shortage that led to folks being in, um, you know, in the hallways, um, you know, is this primarily due to COVID, kind of this workforce shortage? Um, is it a policy kind of need that needs to be addressed with the nursing ratio? Kind of what's your, what are your thoughts there? So it's, it's all of the above. Uh, so what happened during COVID uh, is that a, a lot of people made a lot of money working extra um, and they took the summer off. Uh, I would too. Um, they're tired. They're burned out, um, particularly our, our um, the nursing uh, staff and, and some of the ancillary staff. Uh, people are just frustrated um, and it's good for them to take some time off. But the problem is we have no nurses and it gets more, it's very, very complicated. It gets into the traveler situation, et cetera. It is due to COVID, but there are issues beyond that. Um, the age of the average nurse, I believe, is in the 50s. Um, and so we just don't have enough people coming up the pipeline. So uh, it's COVID, it's burnout, it's frustration, it's a nursing shortage, it's a shortage of everything that's there. Um, I'm, I'm gonna run through the chat if you don't mind, Laura, cause I can do it real fast. Is it legal? Is it typical or illegal for EDs to go on divert? Yeah, we go on divert for EMS. It does, it's not, it's legal. Um, but if a person or an ED or something shows up at our emergency department, we cannot turn them away. So while we may go on divert from EMS, if EMS comes to the emergency department, um, we're gonna take them, we have to. Um, there's, we don't have any option. By the way, that's true even if they, if they had just been there three minutes ago and they turned around and came back in, we have to take them again. Uh, is it typical? Yeah, we do it a lot. Does it work? No, it doesn't. Uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, children with behavioral things boarded for 10 days. Yes, uh, 10 days is actually pretty good. Um, we're seeing them 14 and 20 days. Uh, is there increased medication use? Um, I'm assuming that's talking about, uh, there, there's, yeah, we, we've seen more overdose. We've seen more substance use. We've seen more people who are using just about anything. How can we eliminate, what's an IMD exclusion? I'm sorry, help me. This is one of your words. Yeah, I well, can, is, oh, go ahead. Well, actually I was going to pause you, Dr. Snyder, and and have um, oh, Richard sorry. jump in and, and turn to our round table. We will touch on IMG um, a little bit later, but Richard, feel free to um, kind of, uh, you know, shed light on that and, and help us kick off this round table discussion. 
Yeah, well, well, I think there are probably others who actually have more information about IMD exclusion. So, but uh, let me, um, but basically the, it, it's a restriction on funding for inpatient care through Medicaid um, in hospitals uh, that are, have more than 16 beds. So that's the issue, others can speak to it more. But I had a comment and question for you, Sandy. One is that 100% agree and SAMHSA is very aware and focused in our 988 efforts on two of the things that you that you mentioned, which is the importance of making sure that people who can be helped outside of the emergency room um, are helped outside of the emergency room, whether it's by calling 988, whether it's through mobile crisis, whether it's through crisis receiving and stabilization. Also the importance of diversion from 911 and as we get closer and closer to full availability of 988, uh, the issue of coordination uh, between 988 and 911 um, um, has to receive increased attention on the local, state, and federal level. But I did also have a question for you. On your slide, you talked about EMS wait times and what you referred to as wall times. So does that mean that uh, um, EMS are uh, are having to wait at emergency rooms or having to wait to get to emergency rooms. Could you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, thank you. I, I missed that and I went to tell the story. So what wall time is, is uh, the, the time that EMS waits in a hospital before they can move, transfer care of the patient to the ED staff. Uh, in general, they wait on the uh, ambulance gurney because there's no bed available or no staff to staff that bed. Uh, and that's what wall time is. In Houston, what they, they've said now is when 75% of the ambulances have experienced wall time of greater than 20 minutes, okay? So that's a long time. Uh, if, uh, that means that most of the ambulances are tied up they have now said uh, that those patients should be, they're gonna issue a code. And at that point, EMS is to simply put the patient in the nearest chair, in the nearest bed, or if necessary, on the floor and leave the hospital in order to serve the patients within the city. Houston is uh, already looking at this and establishing it. Other cities are also looking at it. To, to go to this extreme, you know, one should not, you know, I mean, Houston is pushed. So to go to this extreme gives you an idea of how bad the issues are in the emergency department right now. All right, thank you, Dr. Snyder. I do wanna bring in our round table uh, discussion. There's a lot of questions in the chat. So I think we may have to have you back for another presentation, but I do wanna bring in uh, Mary Giliberte of Mental Health America, Dr. DeQuincy Lazine uh, from Prevention Communities LLC to get your thoughts and feedback on both the discussion in the chat and uh, the presentation. So I'll start us off, uh, Laura. Um, I just wanted to comment on the experience. You know, I think Dr. Sandy talked a lot about how people experience the ER. And one thing she didn't mention that happened to me when I was in an ER with a family member was police being called uh, because of someone who was in a psychiatric crisis. So when we talk about the equity implications of 988 and diverting people, I think the ER also has equity implications for people with mental health conditions, not encountering police, not encountering really awful conditions. I mean, everybody talks about what a miserable experience it is uh, to be in an ER with a mental health and, uh, and or substance use condition. And I just wanted to note that it doesn't necessarily have to be like that. I mean, we want to divert people, but I think we also want to think about things like better training for staff, also peer support. You know, we've talked through the crisis jam about peer support and how important it is in some ERs where they're using peer support and when they have transition with peer support, um, it can be very effective in changing that experience, that day to day, um, what it feels like to be in that ER. And the last thing I would just note was community needs assessments. All hospitals do these assessments of community needs over and over again. Mental health ranks pretty high in that. 
And so I wonder how we can better use that process to drive some of the communication that Sandy was talking about between behavioral health and hospitals, and also think about you know, how those resources can perhaps be employed to close some of the gaps. And actually, I did also want to just note there is a policy issue with patient experience that we've been working on uh, with NAMI and others that I just don't know if people are aware of. And that is that when you get admitted to um, the hospital, and, and Cindy talked about how many people get admitted, if you go to a medical ward, when you get out, you get a patient experience survey. The only groups that don't get patient experience surveys are those with psychiatric conditions, okay, behavioral health conditions. If you're dead, or you have a behavioral health condition, you don't get that survey in a general hospital. And that's really, uh, uh, you know, in my view, some of the structural reasons that we see people with <laughs> health conditions really not being treated the way others are and their patient experience being so, so abysmal. So that's another policy issue. Sometimes there are these issues. I know we're gonna have to deal with medical clearances. A lot of times people have to go to the ER for some kind of medical clearance. That has to be changed. Those policy barriers have to be changed so that people can get care in the community and hopefully never go to the ER. But if they do have to go there, I think there are things that we can do um, and should do to improve the experience uh, for people, whether that's telehealth, more use of technology, definitely more use of peers and training. So one, one comment, um, if I may, and that is um, don't be surprised if your emergency department uh, medical director uh, is not familiar with peer support, um, is not familiar with mobile crisis. Um, these are, uh, you know, we, we, we're very, somebody used the word siloed, we're very siloed, okay? And um, so, you know, I, I had never, uh, I'm sure I worked with peer support people, but I never recognized it until probably three or four years ago. Well, thank you, Mary. That is, uh, and uh, Sandy, that's going to have to be the last word, um, but it was so important, particularly those recommendations, Mary, for how we can uh, try to improve the system. Um, there are a lot of questions in the chat. I do want to make sure um, that folks, uh, if you do have anything to add or share your experience from your state or community, do please share that in the chat, and we will have to have you back for uh, additional conversation. So thank you both. Um, and I should also note that Dr. Lazine is not here today, so we are not skipping him, but he is not here. So next slide, please. So this is uh, this week's crisis talk article, I think is also going to generate a lot of discussion. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie uh, to talk about this week's article and expanding the definition of lived experience. Thank you. Yeah, so this week I spoke with Dr. Amy Watson. Uh, she's, the professor, she's a professor at University of Wisconsin. And she's also the president of CIT International. Um, and it's interesting after this conversation that we just had, uh, it's, you know, CIT International, I wonder, is there something like that or comparable um, in the ER or the ED world? Uh, it seems like those, the bridging the gaps would be phenomenal between you're talking about um, it being siloed. It seems like maybe there's a space there. Um, so Dr. Amy Watson, she shared that to address workforce shortages and improve community-centered responses, it's time to develop a community behavioral health crisis responder role and expand upon the definition of lived experience. Um, Dr. Watson, are you on the call? Yes, I'm here. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit about what that role would look like and how expanding the concept of lived experience would improve crisis response. So this really comes out of work that I've been doing with Michael Compton and Leah Pope and now a, a larger group um, to really think about if we have, we, we really don't have the workforce with current professionals right now to mm -hmm. really expand crisis response um, and alternative responses. So. Uh, what we're thinking of with for a new role moving forward, we're going, we're trying to identify what are those core competencies and skills that that crisis responders needs, and then working towards developing pathway 
training and pathways into those roles. Um, and certainly, you know, one of the things that we started thinking about is the way that the EMTs and paramedic professional roles developed, um, because we can't send an MD out to every medical crisis in the community, um, but we can provide training for um, emergency medical response in the field um, and, and then move people into those positions um, rather quickly. And the, the idea of thinking about expanding what we're thinking about as peers is really making sure that that we can develop a workforce of crisis responders that reflect the communities that we're serving. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, kind of broadening what we're thinking about is lived experience um, and, and prioritizing making access to these types, this type of career path to people with, with a pretty broad variety of different types of lived experience so that we can better match those responses to the communities that, um, you know, really the communities that are asking the loudest um, are the loudest in asking for alternatives to police response to behavioral health crisis. Laura, do you have some questions? Well, I, I always have a lot of questions, but I, I think this is a really important discussion and also thinking about it through the framework of equity and making sure that we're right. not um, unnecessarily, uh, you know, gatekeeping and creating barriers to access. Um, I actually would like to bring in, if I could, Stephanie, uh, Lisa St. George, because I would like to get her perspective on kind of what this, with yeah. kind of expanding the definition of lived experience could mean and would mean. So Lisa, I'm not sure if you're on here, but if you are, feel free to hop into the conversation. Yep, I'm on. And um, and thanks for asking me about this. This is a complex topic that is being discussed a lot in the peer support community. But I think that um, for me, um, people who are from a variety of marginalized groups or who've been through various kinds of difficult experiences, you know, they can draw on that compassion that comes from those hard experiences and, and bring that forth when they're working with people in severe uh, challenging experiences. Um, sometimes peer support leadership is worried about this because um, they don't want people who do not have a mental illness to replace those who do because they're easier to hire or whatever. Um, and and I, I agree and I understand where that's coming from, but I also think that, for instance, a person who's losing their sight in middle age due to diabetes or something, and it's causing them grief to the point where they're thinking about harming themselves, needs the support from someone who's had a similar experience to that and not someone who has had a mental health challenge. It's, we, we've got to expand what we're looking at as peer support in many different directions. I do think that the capacity to have um, caring and understanding for the difficulties that people go through in life does need to come from a well of someone who has experienced major challenges. And so I would ask that um, we keep that in mind as we, as we fill these roles so that we get that kind of compassion and trust building that can happen mm -hmm. when someone's walked in hard places. I, I completely agree. And one of the things as we've been talking about this is certainly I could see a role for sort of like peer pro, current care pro, peer providers that want to do crisis work to have some specific certification around this area. So making a path, multiple pathways into this work so that we can provide access and actually you know, recruit a workforce that um, is reflective. And I think that's really important. And we've done a couple panels with, um, you know, kind of groups of stakeholders to ask about what are the skills. And, and the thing that's really come out is people talking about is the ability to develop trust and um, really convey to the person in crisis that, you know, that you're really there for them you're concerned and you want to work towards the best outcome for them. And I think, you know, it, people with, you know, again, life experience of various types of struggles may be in a, you know, a better pos position to develop that trust quickly um, so that we can have, you know, better outcomes and get people the support and connection to care that they need um, without, you know, some of the, the difficulties. I mean, there are certainly 
police officers out there that are doing fabulous work when they are called on to respond to a mental health crisis. And you know, there's licensed clinicians that do as well. Um, but I do think particularly people who can bring that lived experience and connect with people, um, I, I think that's the skills that we need in this space. And I think we really need to value that and develop it and create pathways for people. Yes, thank you so much, Amy. And thank you, Stephanie. Uh, the chat again, I think it is going with lots of different resources and um, kind of uh, other ideas, but this stood out to me from Cindy uh, Kimmins, meet people where they are without judgment and authenticity. So I think that's something that we can all take um, and move forward. If, uh, if folks have not read this week's article, I highly encourage you to do so, talk.crisisnow.com. Uh, okay, so we'll go to the next slide. And thank you, Lisa, as well. I'm sorry that I um, skipped over you. So I saw in the chat that Richard had to step away, um, but I'm just checking to see, do we have any el anyone else from SAMHSA that can give us an update? Oh, there you go. Hi, James. Hey, uh, good uh, morning and afternoon, everyone. I, I'm down in Houston as well, so uh, I'll stick with the uh, morning for now. But um, I think Richard was going to formally introduce me, but it's uh, for many of you I've worked with in the past. Um, I have uh, come back uh, to SAMHSA. I was uh, previously the uh, deputy director for the Veterans Crisis Line and have recently uh, came back and am um, the uh, chief over crisis center operations for 988, which uh, hopefully uh, Richard had shared, that is in the office of the assistant secretary. So right now, um, it's a lot of onboarding, but also looking at uh, the ways we will uh, provide and help uh, really um, uh, strengthen 988 response uh, and support uh, moving forward across um, states and our uh, and our centers specifically in our partnerships. So, very excited to get that uh, up and way. I was hoping he might have a little bit uh, um, more information to share. I do know that we are working to finalize again our uh, main report to Congress on 988, and also did see a comment in the. The, um, chat about uh, 988 being active um, and individuals knowing its existence. I will say that we are working on what that communications will be. I know the Action Alliance is as well. Um, and 988 is effectively active in a lot of um, areas. Um, if you have a cell phone, you can probably access it. The problem is it's not 100%. So to make sure we um, manage uh, effective communications for individuals in crisis, uh, we still encourage people to use the um, 800 number uh, prior to that uh, July 16, 2022 deadline right now. That way, um, everyone has the same level of access, both uh, the 800 number and 988 are both going to continue to um, operate and uh, be available for response through the uh, Lifeline Network. So uh, thanks for those that have already um, said uh, uh, welcome back. And uh, if you have questions for me or if there's ways I can help support, uh, please don't uh, hesitate to ask. So that's it for me, unless there's someone else from uh, SAMHSA on that wants to provide an uh, update. All right. Well, thank you, James, and welcome back. Uh, really glad to have you here, and thank you for pointing out uh, that the full, that 988 will is required to be operational across all telephone options, landline, cell phones, July 16th, uh, 2022. But until that date, you can still reach life-saving resources through the Lifeline by calling 1-800-273-TALK. Um, so please encourage people to still use that 1-800-273-8255 number uh, until that time. Okay, so we're going to, I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Dr. Hepburn of Nashville for an update from the States. Hi, Laura, and thank you. And uh, James, welcome back. It's always nice to see your face and uh, welcome to JAM. So thank you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the IMD exclusion issue. J uh, Richard talked about this earlier. If you go to the next slide, I think uh, the letter is there. Yeah, so um, one of the things we've been concerned about uh, as we move forward with crisis services is that crisis stabilization, short-term crisis uh, residential piece. And we're concerned uh, that uh, those programs may be considered IMDs and therefore not eligible for Medicaid payment. Uh, 
So uh, we've decided that we wanted to push that issue and try and get CMS to give administrative relief for crisis programs so that uh, residential crisis programs do not fall under the IMD. Uh, let me turn it over to Sarah to give more details. Sarah? Great, and, and thank you, Brian. Um, so this letter uh, that is being circulated by uh, Rep Napolitano and Rep Katko, the, the co-chairs of the mental health uh, uh, caucus in the house, um, they are looking for supporting organizations. So if you have any questions about the letter, um, you know, I'm happy to, to follow up with a, a slightly larger copy for people to take a look at. Um, and I'll put my email in the chat. Um, Joseph in the Napolitano office, the legislative director, um, has specifically um, asked that organizations reach out to him directly to let him know if they want to be listed. So he has confirmation in the email. Um, but this letter on the institution of mental diseases uh, exclusion basically will help us to better prepare, as Brian was saying, for the implementation of 988 um, by ensuring that these community-based facilities are able to provide uh, care to the increasing, um, as, as projected by Vibrant, the increasing number of um, calls to the system. So I'm happy to answer any specific questions. Uh, also, again, I'll put my email in the chat. So if anybody wants to reach out after the call is over, I'm happy to, to set up a call or correspond more. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Brian. So I'm actually gonna bring you back, Brian, and put you in the hot seat uh, for this week. Um, and so because today's uh, feature presentation, highlighted uh, increased boarding uh, in emergency departments across the country, figured you would be best positioned uh, kind of with your overview of activities in the state for this question. So the question, if we can bring up the question, which two states have ruled psych boarding unconstitutional? Yeah, thank now, you. You have, you have some options. Uh, yeah. You can poll the audience uh, and they will put their answers in the chat. We can spotlight a friend for you to ask as well, or you could just try and, and take a stab in the dark for yourself. <laughs> yeah, I'm, well, I'm pretty sure one is Washington State, um, but I'm not sure about the other one. Uh, uh, I think Washington State is the one that we've, we've heard most about. And so I would welcome if there's somebody from Washington State uh, to talk about it. But uh, the person that I would like to spotlight is Ken Norton and see if Ken has some information that would help us with this question. So um, I'm not sure if Ken, I saw earlier he was on the call. Ken, are you still on the call? I think Ken is still here. If we could spotlight Ken. He may have dropped or lost okay. connection. Uh, in that case, I guess I would open it up to the audience uh, for, for polling. Is that uh, what we do? If people want to put their answer into the chat? Yes. So we've got some good guesses here in the chat. We've got a lot of New Hampshire's. That feels like a strong um, consensus from the chat. This is Ken Norton. Can you hear me now? Ah, there you go, Ken. Hi, Brian. Um, so can you help yeah, me with this, Ken? It, I can, and, um, and the New Hampshire Supreme Court did rule unanimously this spring, but it was a very limited issue. And the issue was whether people being boarded in um, a mental health crisis and emergency departments were entitled to a due process hearing within 72 hours. So it's, it's very limited. The, they were not getting due process hearings. The, the state was contending that the due process hearing started upon admission not upon uh, being detained in the emergency room. Thank you. So Ken sounds like he knows what he's talking about. So I would, my answer would be Washington State and New Hampshire. Okay, well, you are trusting your friend and we saw Dr. Adair go wrong last week uh, uh, and when he didn't trust his audience and uh, spotlighted friends. So let's see what the two answers are for this week.
There you go, Washington and New Hampshire, uh, 100%. <laughs> Great job, Brian. Thank you, Ken. Uh, and thank you for everyone in the chat. Um, you all got that right. So very exciting that uh, we are uh, aware of what's going on with psych boarding, uh, but clearly more work that still needs to be done. Uh, we're going to go back over to Sarah uh, Corcoran to see if there are any federal updates you wanted to share with us. Yeah, and, and thank you, uh, Laura. Um, so we do have a few updates, and I think the next slide might help uh, show some of the, the different things going on. If we can move one slide uh, down the, okay, great. Okay, so you see we have slightly updated this uh, chart of all the activity in the House and Senate uh, with the reconciliation uh, package, which is that human infrastructure package that was originally uh, targeted around 3.5 trillion. Uh, we got word last night that the Biden administration has instructed um, the House and Senate to aim closer to a $1.9 trillion level. We don't have a, a full lineup of what exactly this would mean, especially for the behavioral health, mental health space. Um, but there is some rumor that there'll be some sort of um, Medicare extensions as well as some of the Affordable Care Act pieces and potentially Medicaid um, gap coverage for those states that did not expand. So we'll um, wait to see, but the, the soonest that we could see a framework come together without a ton of specifics would be later this week, but a lot would have to go right for that to actually happen. Um, but we'll keep you posted on that. And then the uh, other thing that uh, we wanna update on is in that middle appropriations row. Um, and the Senate released a, uh, a slew of spending bills for FY22. And for those of us keeping track, that has already started. But right now, we are on a continuing resolution to keep the government funded through December 3rd. Uh, we've got in this specific middle box here um, a lineup of some of the, the mental health, behavioral health funding items in that bill that's been proposed. Um, there is still disagreement between House and Senate. Those bills are not the exact same and they're not funded at the same levels and same initiatives. And it seems that um, the, the Senate Republicans do still have some issues with the defense numbers. So this is not a, a done deal by, by any means and we will need to either have another continuing resolution past uh, December 3rd to keep the government open and funded or an agreement between House and Senate to, to get this um, moving forward. Uh, also at that time, the, uh, the debt ceiling discussions will be you know, coming back up again because we did have a short-term extension to that early December mark. So it's gonna be a, uh, a busy time in DC, but we'll of course keep you posted as uh, things develop. Thank you, Sarah. There are a lot of developments, uh, I think in every area that you have listed here. So thank you. We just really appreciate you keeping us updated. Um, if folks are looking for a copy of the letter that uh, Brian showed earlier or uh, want to sign on at, for their organization, what's the best way for them to do that? If you send me an email, it's scorcoran, C-O-R-C-O-R-A-N at guide lobby, G-U-I-D-E dot com. Uh, that will, I will get you a full copy of the letter, a little bit bigger than we were able to see on the screen today. Uh, and I'll also drop into the chat the links to the, the Senate um, FY22 bill summary for people to take a look at. Uh, but please reach out to me. I'm happy to answer questions and connect you with Joseph uh, to confirm if you would like to be a supporting uh, organization on that Dear Colleague letter. And that closes next Monday, the 25th at the end of the day as of now. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much, Sarah. Now we're going to turn to the states who are often tasked with implementing uh, what comes from the federal government. So I'll uh, turn it over to Hannah Wazilowski, um, if she's here. Hey, Laura, this is, this is Stephanie. I'm actually going to fill in for Hannah. Perfect. Thanks, Steph. Yeah, um, so this is um, Steph Pasternak. Um, I'm with AMI's national office. Um, on the state front, not a lot is moving at this time. Um, it's kind of a quiet time of year for a lot of state legislatures. Um, looking at the map, the, the bills that have been most recently introduced are those from Michigan, 
um, House Bill um, 5353 and House Bill 5354. Um, there's two bills because really the first one really deals with 988 policy changes. And then the second one um, covers all of the fiscal elements of 988 implementation. Um, we're also hearing um, that Pennsylvania stakeholders are considering 988 legislation and that um, a possible fee is a part of those discussions, so we might see some legislation there. Um, we're also expecting um, something to be introduced in Florida. Um, it just hasn't officially dropped yet, so nothing we can really share there. Um, but I will say, if you want more um, it, in detail updates, um, NAMI is now hosting monthly 988 calls for state advocates, um, where you can really hear directly from the folks on the ground who are um, pushing for these bills, um, what's going on in their state, um, you know, and also an opportunity for state level advocates to share um, different successes and challenges they're having with 988 policy. And I can actually drop in the chat um, a link to how you can sign up for those calls. Uh, our, our next call will be on November 1st at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Just drop the link um, for the monthly 98 state advocate calls in the chat. Um, and also just quickly, another event I want folks to be aware of um, that is completely dedicated to building momentum um, to improve crisis services ahead of the launch of 988 um, is Reimagine, a week of action to reimagine our national uh, response to people in crises. Um, this is an event that NAMI is hosting um, with other leading advocacy organizations, many of whom are on this call. Um, it is a week of virtual events happening November uh, 15th through the 19th. Um, and you're gonna hear a lot of personal stories um, about how the current crisis response um, impacts individuals and families and communities, the promise of 988, um, and importantly, how folks can um, get involved and create um, impactful change. And that is a, an event that you can register for at our website here. I'm just gonna put that link in the chat. And I don't wanna take any more time because I know Hannah and I will be on next week to talk more about this week of action, but um, folks can register at that link. Um, and it's also, um, there's no registration fee with this event. So, Perfect, thank you, Stats. This is really helpful um, just to help inform and close that information gap for policymakers so that they know the importance of putting those pieces into place for coordinating a crisis continuum, as well as sustainably funding one. So thank you so much. I also wanna uh, just quickly highlight in the chat, uh, MHA shared information uh, about getting the word out of CDC's updated list of mental health conditions uh, for folks at risk of COVID-19. So please share that. She put the link in there as well. Um, we uh, Paul isn't with us today, so we're gonna go ahead and skip the calculator and go to the next slide. And uh, just very quickly, uh, again, we have shown, and we can go to the next slide as well, uh, kind of the overview from states that have enacted 988 legislation. And next slide, uh, we've both had the privilege of having Washington and Nevada stakeholders uh, talk through both their challenges uh, and success for 988 legislation and anticipated revenue for uh, a 988 uh, a surcharge. So coming soon, uh, as uh, Steph mentioned, next or the week of uh, November 3rd, uh, that Wednesday, we will have Steph and Hannah back from NAMI to talk about their week of action. Uh, next week, the 27th, I think it's really going to be another great uh, discussion with lots of uh, uh, activity in the chat around workforce. You know, workforce has really emerged as the issue. Um, that, it, that will impact our ability to build capacity uh, and to serve individuals in crisis the way um, that we, we need to. Uh, and if that workforce isn't there, you know, what do we do? So I'm really looking forward to that presentation from Dr. Watson. Uh, and then for November 10th, we'll have Dr. Madeline Gould uh, talking about lifeline evaluation. Uh, and then November 17th, Ron Bruno and the dedicated mental health crisis response model. So lots of good presentations coming up. We will have Thanksgiving holiday off on the 24th. Uh, next slide. And, and also wanted to highlight the episode four for Moving America's Soul 
on suicide. Again, this is uh, multiple episodes that we've highlighted uh, every week and just wanted to let folks know uh, you can see them at masosfilm.com. Next slide. And you, again, you can access all of the resources that we've discussed today, uh, including SAMHSA's National Guidelines for Behavioral Health Crisis Care, uh, Crisis Services Meeting the Needs at crisisnow.com slash library. Uh, and uh, you can view past presentations at uh, talk.crisisnow.com slash learning community. We are right at one o'clock and I wanna thank you all for spending your afternoon and morning with us. This has been a great discussion and I look forward to next week. Thank you all.